as has already been said, Brother Jonathan's topic is receiving a love of the truth. And this text that he has in 1 Thessalonians 2.10, it approaches it from the negative aspect of not receiving the love of the truth. But Brother Jonathan is going to look at this from the opposite of the way the text uh, presents it, of those who do receive a love of the truth and the benefits that um, are granted to those who are obedient in this and who receive the love of the truth and the, the reward that there is um, for doing so. Now, to love something is to prefer that thing above all else. It is to place a high value on that thing that you love. When you love something, you'll not, you'll not throw it away as though it were trash or garbage or sell it at any price because it's precious to you and you can't replace it. Those who love the truth view the truth in this aspect. It's precious to them. They will receive it and keep it as receiving a treasure. And they're not going to allow anyone to come and steal those things away from them. They're going to guard them and keep them safe. Mm -hmm. If God, who we know is not willing that any should perish, would punish the wicked so completely as to condemn them for eternity and to consign them to that fate for not receiving a love of the truth, then consider the opposite and the blessing for those who do receive a love of the truth. Amen. <clears throat> How much greater a reward can we look forward to as those who have received a love of the truth and do love the things that are of, the, of his kingdom? We have obeyed from the heart and we have received much from the Lord. So we as believers and as, as those who love the truth can look forward to this great reward that the righteous are going to receive. And, and this reward is something that is beyond our comprehension. We, we can't really completely fathom the greatness of this reward Amen. or the pleasures that await those who are faithful. Mm -hmm. The world, they are content with to have pleasure for a season. But that time of pleasure in this earth is going to be cut off. But the pleasure that we will receive for being faithful, it's never going to end. <clears throat> there, now, there are several examples in the scriptures of those uh, godly men and women who did this. They received the truth and received a love for it. And one of those uh, examples is Lydia. Um, from Acts 16, verses 14 through 15. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, mm -hmm. that she attained unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So Lydia had heard the gospel preached. She had given her ear to what was good. She had not given herself to seeking after the things of this world. Here is a woman who had a heart that was toward God. She noticed that she was already worshiping God. She was already in laboring to the best of her ability at the time she was laboring for the Lord. <clears throat> she was seeking him. And we know that there, we have a promise. If you seek, you will find. And so this is this Lydia. She was seeking the truth and the Lord found her and she found the Lord. And, and we know uh, that she then received it. Lydia's response to the things she heard were the result of the Lord opening her heart to receive the truth. She had a heart that was tender and pliable, so the Lord was able to work with her. When the truth presented itself, the Lord, he had access to her heart so that he could open it, and it, it was of a, a tender nature so that it, he was able to shape her in his hands. But those who reject the truth the 
action of rejecting the truth actually serves to harden one's heart so that the Lord is not able to open their heart so that they might receive these good things. Sin hardens the heart. It has the effect of making a callus over the heart so that your, your past feeling is the way the scriptures describes it. Those whose hearts are calloused, they don't feel the prick of sin. They don't feel the pain that sin that is associated with sin. <clears throat> so there is nothing to keep them from going headlong into these things uh -huh. that the Lord has said that he would turn them over to uh -huh. if they did not receive a love of the truth. <clears throat> but Lydia was not so. She had protected her heart. Yes. She had spent her time worshiping God and she had given her ears to listening to what God, God's people had to say. So when the time came for her to believe, she was ready God. to receive that. She, had, she, this, she is also an evidence that receiving a love of the truth will motivate you uh -huh. to continue laboring for the Lord and will give you the ability to do so at a greater level than you were once able to. Amen. Immediately after her heart was opened by the Lord, her first uh, course of action was to be baptized and her whole household. Uh -huh. But she did not stop there. She continued to, to seek to labor for the Lord. And she sought that, the, that Paul and those traveling with him would stay in her house. Yeah. And so she, you can see how she believes so receiving a love for the truth will continue to enable you to work and to minister to the body. It will give you the tools that you need in order to be productive in the kingdom. <clears throat> This is the effect that receiving a love of the truth has on the believer. Those who love the truth are happy to see others receive it as well and are willing to spend and be spent that the truth might prosper. Yes. So she was opening her home so that Paul and those with, traveling with him would be in a position where they could labor more productively. They didn't have to worry about these other things. They had a place to stay. They had... You know, a meal. They didn't have to worry about these lesser things. So that was the ministry that Lydia desired to have. And on top of that, she had the blessing of having Paul staying in her home. So you can see why this was a, a motivating thing for her to constrain them. So she wasn't, she wasn't going to let anything stop her from being productive and being useful and being a help to the brethren. So we see the truth as a precious treasure that we have been given, we've been entrusted with the truth. God has given it to us, and he's entrusted this great, uh, valuable treasure with us. And it makes us eager not only to labor in menial things uh, that we might consider to not be very important in, in comparison to other things, but it also enables us to to labor in those, the, the weightier things also of being able to speak the truth, being able to expound the scriptures. And so we can see how receiving a love for the truth is very important. This is not something that we can do without, as we know the punishment for not doing so is grave. And so I will uh, turn the, it over to brother Jonathan now, as he continues to expound this, uh, passage. Amen. The instructions that the sisters give are very beneficial. Uh -huh. Give thanks for the opportunity for them to do that. Amen. Really add to us who speak as well. Well, let's be clear about something. Well, there's no love for the truth. There's no salvation present. So you can see that in our passage. If men believe a lie, it's because they have rejected or turned down the truth that's been offered to them. Uh -huh. We will find, as we have in times past, that everything that we do that pleases the Lord is done by God's involvement. If you take pleasure in the truth, you should be thankful to the Lord that you do, because he's the reason that you do. I'm going to read our main passage here, and then I'll give some background for it. It's a 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, but I'm going to start at verse 8. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You see, you're not going to really find that expression, receive a love of the truth, anywhere else, but right here in this main passage here. It's kind of like a unique expression right there. Well, the passage is, in fact, referring to not receiving the love of the truth, we do see in the passage a very valuable and weighty truth to consider. In this chapter in Thessalonians, we read, like, you know, close to the beginning, the believers shouldn't let anyone deceive them by any means. That's something said at the beginning of chapter 2 here, seeing that the day of Christ is coming up. Paul makes mention that the day of Christ will not come until a great falling away take place first. To paraphrase, things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. The heat's going to crank up. Foes are going to be more aggressive. It's not a time to be sloppy. He's like, I wouldn't have you unaware, ignorant brethren. Let's scripture say, I would not have you be ignorant brethren. No, let that day take you as a thief. It is also mentioned that a man of sins or a son of perdition shall be revealed. So things are going to get real perilous in the last times. However, those who are deceived are not going to be with excuse. Our text affirms that those who perish will do so because they received not a love for the truth. Amen. Because of this, it says in the next two verses that the Lord will send them strong delusion, that they might believe a lie, that those who don't believe the truth will be damned. In consideration of our main theme for these meetings, this may not seem to be a very fitting passage. However, the passage does show us the need for men to receive that love for the truth. That We do learn that from this, and that's where we will go. That's why we must be Caref we carefully pay attention to the wording of this text because, you know, it is said quite precisely. The passage does not say that these people perish because they didn't receive the truth, even though that is true. The passage does not say that they perish because they refused to love the truth, even though that is true also. It says that they perish because they did not receive the love yeah. of the truth. Yeah. Now, one might read this and think God simply just commands us to love the truth, and that's our obligation to do it. You know what? The Lord does say, love the Lord your, thy God. We're not going to deny that. But that's just not the conclusion this passage leads you to. It's like, just, just love it. All right. No, there's something. There's a work of God involved in there. And this we see the Lord is at work, and once again, in our salvation. Now, what exactly is this passage saying when it says, love the love of the truth? Love is one of those words that's greatly abused, and it's tossed around quite a bit in our day. You will, when you hear someone like say use that word love, you'll, see, you'll hear it used in quite a variety of ways, and often it's used quite loosely. Like, for example, you'll hear someone like say that they love their wife. Well, hey, that's good, but then you'll turn around and hear someone say they love a Snickers bar. Do you love that Snickers bar like you love that a man loves his wife? It's used in a very different way. Maybe someone will watch a movie or a show, and, they'll, and then they'll, if they like it, they'll say, well, I, lo I loved that show. Yeah. Or if they have a meal, it's like really especially good, they'll say, oh, I love this. I love this food. Or sometimes if a person like me gets a very generous gift, something that people are like, oh, I love I Oh, I opened it up. Oh, I love it. You know, you'll, well, I'm saying this is used quite a bit. And sometimes when people find something ridiculous, maybe to the point of it being humorous, they'll say, well, I love it when people say, or I love it when people do, you know, etc. So you see, the word's used a whole host of ways, which brings you to the question, like, what, in what way do men love the truth, though? Is it love like, like in this sense? Now, in the Psalms, you'll read expressions like this. It says, I love the Lord. Thy law do I love. I love thy commandments. I love thy testimonies. I love thy precepts. That's all in the Psalms right there. Now, all these expressions have one thing in common. They all have to do with God. The Psalms won't say, I love something, unless it has to do with God. And that's the way we, ha that's the way we think, too. If men love God, they love anything that comes from God, anything that's offered by Him. In this sense, love truly means to have a strong affection or a desire or an attraction to something, a strong one, nothing casual like men might use it today. If men love the Lord, then they're going to draw close to Him. They're not content with a distance. And they're going to be zealous to please Him. They want, they want to be, make Him glad with Him. If men love the truth, then they're always glad to hear it, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like you can just see the reaction when you preach the truth. What is the reaction? If they love it, well, they're going to sound good. It sounds good to people who yeah. love the truth. As the scriptures say, they meditate on the law day and night. That's like the effect of the truth. If you love the truth, then this isn't something that's just going to go in the one ear, not the other. It's going to stick with you. Mm -hmm. You're going to, like, ponder on it, dwell on it, keep it, examine it further. 
The truth has a value that places it above all other things that may try and compete with it. Amen. If someone loves the truth, then the truth is like it's their primary interest above other interests. Like anything under that just isn't a question. They will always put the truth over everything else. They will choose it above everything else. They don't turn it down an opportunity to feed on it. If there's an opportunity to feed on the truth, people love the truth, they'll jump right in. Tell us more. Now, having said all this, it seems like strange language in our time, considering all the things that professing Christians are doing with their time nowadays. It seems that people in the church truly can't endure sound doctrine in our time when they can not bear more than maybe an hour of church for a week. That doesn't sound like someone who loves the truth. And I understand in some cases it's not the people's fault. Some people do want more, but the church just won't give it to them. We don't want to, like to say, everyone who has a short church service is that way. But that's the situation. It seems that people are not looking for time to read and ingest the Word of God when you can hardly count on one hand someone who's read the entire book. It does not appear that the love of the truth is common when hardly anyone knows what the truth is and just makes little effort to know what it is. There's not really like this effort. You have to know this. You have to have this. They don't have that attitude. This is not an innocent situation at all and shouldn't be explained away by some simple theory. Today, the church is coming up with all kinds of ideas and methods to try to get more people into the four walls. You know, people just aren't interested nowadays. And it's, then people, they're trying, they're trying. They're trying to get more people in. They have their methods. Sometimes they offer shorter church services. Do you feel uncomfortable here? We'll tell you what, we'll just cut it in half and it won't be so unbearable for you. People think that'll bring people in. And sadly, sometimes it does. But sometimes they'll try to make, bring more people in by making allowances for certain things that carnal people like it's like you like to smoke well we have we smoke while we read the bible they'll bring those smokers in or you like to drink well we have alcohol at our church you know they'll that i just read about this recently they're trying to bring people in with this or you like worldly music where well, our praise band sounds just like those carnal bands you like that'll bring them in or maybe casual dress ah don't look so nice come as you are what whatever people mean by that or even sometimes like as of late it's like, well, we accept the sodomites. They are welcome here. We accept them. This is what people think. We'll bring them in. Sometimes they limit the amount of scripture. Let's Bible more examples, something that relates more to the people. All these methods, they're just completely useless, and they're used apart from God's assistance. If men are going to receive a love for the truth, they certainly will not get it, subjecting themselves to less of God and more of the world. They will not receive it by being encouraged to continue in things that hinder them from following Christ. If men will receive the love of the truth, they have to hear the truth. Amen. Otherwise, men will only fail continually. That's why I believe that the modern church is failing so badly at its task. It's not holding forth the truth. Mind you, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, so that's just unacceptable. Rather, it is holding out something that's far less in value, something that even the world does not find fascinating enough to change their life for. They don't. What the church is, what people are seeing displayed, it just doesn't look worth it. Yeah. But the truth is worth it. Amen. And those who desire it will see it. Let's just face it. What about when men do hear the truth, you know? We're talking about like just in our current time, people aren't here, but when people do hear it, people are hearing it. When men receive the love of the truth, it's because they in fact recognize the goodness of it. That's why we have expressions like taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, it's good. Try it out. Take some of this in. Just see for yourself. You will not be disappointed. That's like, some, that's like something held out in the gospel. The gospel, when it's actually preached, it has a wonderful sound that draws men to the Lord. Like we have a song, one of the verses that says, We have heard the joyful sound. It's from the song, Jesus Saves. We've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. It's like a description of the gospel message. It's not just noise. It's a joyful sound. The gospel gives nothing but good news to those who desire righteousness. The gospel tells men about Christ and what he's accomplished and what's coming for those who serve him. And the gospel also tells of a way out of damnation and eternal torment. People who realize they're in that state, that is truly good news to hear. The gospel, it's good of itself. When men recognize that, God gives them the love of the truth. They will be given an appetite for it so that they continue in it. Now, it may seem odd that men have to receive the love of the truth, but that is what the passage says. So you have to just take it how it's written. Receive the love of the truth. The love of the truth, as well as the truth itself, it's offered by God to men. Yeah. Receive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Receiving, that I means receive, that's your part. That's but right. in order to receive something, someone has to be given or offered yeah. to you first. 
And this is one of those things that is offered. Like when the scriptures say, set your affection on things above, that heavenly affection came from God. The fact is men don't naturally have an appetite for the things of God, otherwise the love of the truth would just not, it wouldn't need to be offered if that were the case. Men by nature are sinful. They don't have appetite for heavenly things. They don't. If this were not so, then God would not have to give men a new heart and a new spirit. If this were true, he would not have to write his law on their hearts and minds. Men would not have to be born again. The scriptures are clear that every man has gone his own way and that there's none, there are none that are good. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's sadly one of the more understood things in the scriptures, but it's true. It is true. Apart from divine intervention, man's only going to go his way and no one else's. The scriptures even say that the heart, this is the unregenerate heart, is de desperately wicked and deceitful. Now, how could a proper response come from that? It can't. As a psalmist wrote, Create in me a clean heart. See, he recognized it, that a good heart comes from God. My natural heart isn't good, isn't good enough. Make me, make me compatible with you. Like in the case that Sister Maddie touched on, God must first open someone's heart before they can receive. If you think about it, when you receive the love of the truth, where do you put it? Did not David say that he hides the Lord's word in his heart? That's how I'm looking at it. He opens your heart and you're able to take it in. If someone hears the truth and sees that it is good, God's going to create in that, person an, in that person an appetite so they can continue in it. Like in the case of Lib Lydia, there has to be some kind of effort on your part. Receive. Receive means you take it. means you take hold of it. That's you. Don't think this is like arbitrary or automatic, like God's just going to randomly just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. you love the truth. That's not how it works. It's held out, and there's an opportunity for like a response from you. What are you going to do with it? And so those who seek after it, like the scripture says, they'll find it. He'll give it to them. There's a reason God gives this love of the truth to men. Like now Lydia, for example, she was listening. Okay, she was making some kind of effort to hear, to take in. And that's when the Lord opened her heart. The disciples learned the meaning of the par parables when they asked the Lord Jesus what they meant. So, I mean, see, there was some kind of effort to, like, go and see more before the Lord gave more. And that's the same for all men. The scriptures say, Seek and ye shall find. Everyone know, here knows that they've experienced this to be so. You've sought and you've found. You've seen it. You've tasted this. You've seen it's just a, this is something we're just ignorant of. We've experienced it, so we know this to be true. See, God could bring men to a point where they're willing to seek the truth because it doesn't take long to realize the world has nothing to offer. That's why the scriptures say the Lord's drawn to those of a broken and a contrite spirit. People are broken. They're left with nothing. When men are not satisfied with the world, that makes the gospel sound so much better. So God brings you into that state, too. God can work things out to where he'll make you ready to hear it. And when they do hear it, they'll receive it, and then God will just create in them that affection for it. It's, it's people like these that God gives these things to. Now, this would also explain a lack of interest in the truth in our time. Men don't desire to hear the truth, and hence God's given them no appetite for it. In fact, some people seem to get green in the face when you talk about the truth. And I talk about church people also. They just cannot dwell on it long before having to switch to something else. Well, how about that game last night? Well, see... It'll try to divert in some way. They can't like really talk for prolonged amounts of time uh -huh. on the things of God. It's like it's like you eat, there's certain things like you'll eat, eat a few bites. You're just like I can't finish that. It's just ugh. It's just it's not. I'm having a very unsettling feeling here, and if I eat any more, something bad's about to happen. Well, sometimes the truth can have that effect on those who don't love it. <laughs> it does have. It does make them very uneasy. But rather, God has made it where men will embrace a lie instead. He says he gives them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Believe that's like embrace, which will result in their own destruction. God's not going to give a love for the truth for those who are not seeking it or desiring it. God offers this through the gospel, and if you reject the gospel, you reject the love of the truth as well. And ultimately, salvation itself in the process, hence it says, they do receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So the love of the truth, that's like equated with salvation. That's like an evidence of salvation itself. You got to think about that. Your interest and your desire into the things of God, that's like proof for yourself and for others that you are, in fact, saved. I mean, if you are, like, getting nauseous when someone reads from the Bible, then I'm sorry, this does not paint a very good picture for you. 
In fact, it, it portrays a contradiction mm -hmm. because it says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Yeah. They're not content anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I love thy law. I just don't like hearing it much. See, I mean, the scriptures just don't talk that way. They always talk in large amounts, prolonged amounts of time. I don't want to be anywhere else. That's the attitude in the scriptures when they say they love God. Yeah. I'm not getting anywhere else. And hence, we have to examine ourselves and see, too, that we, that we are in this state as well. God will make you in that state if you desire it. If men don't love the truth, then God has no desire to take that person to himself. But we should understand also that there's great benefit to loving the truth when you consider the foes that are fighting against us. Our main chapter clearly says, Let no man deceive you at any time. Any time. Christ spoke at f false prophets and false apostles and even false Christ that would rise up in the world and deceive many. Peter spoke of false teachers who are as brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. John spoke that there were many antichrists in the world and Paul said, Beware of dogs. So all of them had this awareness that there's forces out there trying to win you over. A lot of them. Men all over the world trying to draw you away from God in the name of Christianity. They do not leave people astray showing themselves for what they are. Like they don't come and say, well, I'm a false teacher. Like I'm here to draw you away from God. Right? They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Appearing as one of us. Satan himself, he is a roaring lion. But he does not appear as a lion to those who he approaches. Rather, he displays himself as an angel of light. So as far as those who are deceived is concerned, he looks like one of the good guys. Looks like someone you can trust. And like an angel comes in the scriptures, usually that's a messenger from God. So it's like, I portray myself as an angel. So naturally, people might think, oh, he's from God. This is one of, the Lord sending me a sign here. <laughs> However, when he lures them into his net, that, and he has them in vulnerable attack, that's when that devouring takes place. He doesn't appear as an angel anymore. He has successfully taken them. Likewise, men simply don't just stand outside the church, openly men, they're trying to turn you away from the Lord. I do, there are men who do that, but I'm talking about false teachers, though. Rather, they come professing to be messengers of God. They deceive while holding Bibles in their hands and standing behind pulpits. In proper apparel, too. The message they speak is claimed to be from God, and they kind of use that as like bait to lead genuine souls astray. It's like, God told me. Some people, I just have to say, no, he didn't. God did not talk to you. I can tell by what you said, that's not from God. Just tell him, no, that did not come from God. It contradicts what's said here. Don't be afraid to say stuff like that. False teachers must not be followed by anyone. But what can possibly keep us from falling for these deceptions and lies? I would say receiving a love for the truth is definitely a requirement here. Like the saying goes, if you love the truth, you're going to hate the lie. Here we see that having an appetite and affection for the things of God will actually be a protection to the believer in times, when there are, in times of deception. You remember Christ did say that false Christ, false Christ would deceive many, and if it were possible, the very elect. If it were possible. Now why are the elect not deceived? It's because they have... They are kept by God from the strength of the enemy. That's why. Yeah. The elect of God love the truth and their knowledge and love for it will keep them from being led astray by the lie. Amen. That's the means by which he keeps them. This is why it's so important that we do what we do here, and that is we frequently feed on the word. We frequently meet. And it's not a sense out of obligation either. I mean, I know everyone here wants to be here. We're not just coming here because I have to be. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. We do, we do want to be here. This is like our evidence to one another that we do have this affection because we're so willing to just meet so frequently without any kind of disruption in our schedule, without any kind of, oh, without any negativity from negative response from anyone. Everyone's glad to do it when we do it. As long as we have the affection for the things of God, hearing that truth will only make our love for it stronger. If we cut down on our time in the truth, then other ungodly interests will soon get in the way, and then deception will become inevitable. Maintain your faith and participate in activities that provoke godly living. Abide in Christ and he'll keep you from falling. See, the, ad the attitude is here is like, I can't afford to lose the truth. I can't, af I can't afford that. I mean, it's just too costly. It's like, this is salvation hinges on this. It's like, my love for the truth is like what confirms that I'm saved. And if I'm drawn away and um, taken in a fault, as the scriptures say, well, then that puts me in a state of jeopardy. So the things that we have, we have to, like the scriptures say, hold fast till I come. That's what Jesus said. Guard that. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Stand yeah. fast. Keep it. Guard it. And the fact that you're even guarding it, that just shows of itself that you do, in fact, love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I'm sure 
everyone here when you love your child. If any the threat arrives, you're going to protect your child. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the way I am with the truth. I mean, it's mine. It's been given to me. And it's something I don't want to lose. I can't afford to lose it. Because if I do, it's going to have a, it's going to have a devastating effect. So this is just your confirmation of the truth. Like, how fear- aggressive are you to keep it in your possession? I say that the fact that you still have it now confirms that you have, in fact, kept it and are willing to continue keeping it. So we give thanks that the Lord has given this capacity to us, and we pray that he will strengthen and widen that capacity as well.